Salt Lake City, I gotta tell you, I don't miss going into an office per se, but I do love the faux co-worker vibes at the shop workspace. In the commons area, you get all the fun benefits of having co-workers to gossip with without having to shield your computer screen from a watchful boss. I'm calling it friendly productivity. Join a community that works, connects, and succeeds together at the Shop Workspace on 400 South. Visit shopworkspace.com for details. Salt Lake City, the Mattress Warehouse President's Day Sale is the perfect time to invest in your spine and upgrade your mattress. It is the core of your being, my dude. And you will save up to $1,000 on top brands like King Coil, Purple, Tempur-Pedic, Sealy, Serta, Stearns & Foster. Let Mattress Warehouse custom fit you to the right mattress for you. Are you a side sleeper? No problem. Are you a stomach sleeper? I'm judging you, but they won't. Find their nearest location at mattresswarehouseutah.com. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. New developments in the Millers' effort to bring a Major League Baseball team to the Fair Park neighborhood is starting to look a lot like the Inland Port Authority. Plus, one legislator's proposal to really reimagine public transit across Salt Lake County. Executive producer Emily Means is here to rant, rave, and share picks of the week with me. It's Friday, February 23rd. I'm Ali Vallarta. And this is CityCast Salt Lake. Executive producer Emily Means, good morning. Good morning, host Ali Vallarta. I got an email this morning from Utah Policy written presumably by Holly Richardson. Did you see this this headline about horses? No, but it sounds like it was speaking directly to you. Well, the subject line was, and I just got to hand it to her, massaging a horse may no longer require a license. Will legislators vote nay? And Holly! It was one Holly, of, you queen! Like, part of me was like, <laughs> I respect this. And then part of me was like, just a reminder that we are all crawling to the end of this legislative yeah. session. Like, no one is doing well. <laughs> wow. No, I mean, this is this is um, the part of the session where legislators themselves get punchy. And you always hear that on the floor during floor debates. They're like, oh, we're a little punchy. And it's like, yeah, we are losing our minds. Can we get this over with? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing in that punch, but okay. Yeah, (laughs) I get it. That said, we still have a few days left. The legislative session ends on March 1st, at which point lawmakers will announce sign die and stop writing and passing bills that we have to pretend to be lawyers and untangle and understand Uh, on this show. And it also means they will stop changing the way that we live our day to day lives minute by minute with their big ideas. Um, Let's talk about some of the bills that we are obsessed with this week. Let's. So I am interested in a transit bill. And I just want to say like, for anyone who isn't a transit nerd, I will try and explain this in a way that is as interesting as possible. (laughs) But um, because I myself am not a public transit nerd. Right. And so this bill is HB 430. It's called Local Government Transportation Amendments. And I have to give a huge shout out to my friend Jeff, who knows a lot about transit, who helped me understand this, because this is a bill that's actually trying to solve a very real problem. And that problem is that growing municipalities in the south part of Salt Lake County need public transit options. Like most of the growth is happening in the south part of Salt Lake. Think like Harriman, Bluffdale, right? Uh, Daybreak Mm -hmm. area. Um, Though Daybreak, I will say, is like already fairly well served. Yeah. It's the end of the line, Mm -hmm. the end of the red line as far as they go. Yeah. Representative Candace Perucci, who has introduced this legislation, said in a hearing, there's not a single bus stop in Harriman, Riverton, or the Bluffdale area. That's legit. But here is how she has proposed solving that problem. She's saying, so, therefore, what we want is to stop contributing our tax dollars to the transit pot and getting very little in return for it. So what we would like (laughs) is to 
get back the money that we're currently paying to the Utah Transit Authority in transit tax and just be able to use that pot of money as kind of a grant to do whatever we want, to build our own transit system. And the problem with that is that if you look at the Utah Transit Authority's budget, Salt Lake City contributes 30 percent to Salt Lake County's transit tax revenue. And the communities in the southwest part of the county contribute about 2%. So say the budget for transit is $100 million. That would mean that Salt Lake City gets $30 million to use on transit, and her communities in the South County get $2 million. You're not going to be able to build a very good transit system with $2 million, right? Hmm. It could also mean that not necessarily those municipalities, but other municipalities in the county get less. Like, say... That happens, okay? And South Salt Lake gets the percentage they contribute, and that's around 2%, so $2 million. What then happens to the bus that goes down State Street from Salt Lake City to South Salt Lake when it basically crosses a city line and stops being funded in the same way? Are there less stops? Does it implode? (laughs) (laughs) Just disappear. Right, (laughs) right. So like, I think this is really kind of an interesting problem because the the great irony of if this bill passes is that it could make transit in Salt Lake City freaking awesome because we would just get Mm. so much money. But then Mm. if you want to go to Riverton, if you want to go to South Salt Lake, if you would like to ride the ski bus up to Alta, like, good luck out there. Mm. This is so interesting, Allie. I mean, has Representative Perucci considered putting more funding Mm. into UTA's budget on behalf of uh, the south part of the valley? That's a good question. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, UTA, for all of their faults, Mm -hmm. and I was a transit rider for many, many years. I still am, although I live downtown, so I mostly walk. Um, You know, they're pretty good at their jobs, Mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, the Trax train goes from Salt Lake City to Draper on the south end of the valley. Um, And then... Uh, to West Valley. And like, you know, it's it's not just within Salt Lake City. Like UTA knows what they're doing as a regional transit planner. And they're responding to demand. I mean, we heard yeah. the same argument when the ski bus was a nightmare last season. And it's been it feels like things have been quieter on that front this year, though we've had less snow. Um, but like the UTA has to prioritize demand. Like it might feel like the ski bus is highest demand in your community of skiers. But the reality is like they do need to prioritize people who are commuting to work day to day over a recreational transit option. Right. And I mean, the idea of like a municipal transit authority is not Mm far-fetched, right? Like, we see this in Park City. They have their own... um, Summit County and Park City both now have their own transit programs. And it's banging. And it's banging. And, you know, so it's not impossible for a city to do this themselves. Mm -hmm. But I think... UTA, again, like having this expertise and experience and already having a network built out, it kind of makes more sense in my mind for Harriman and the south end of the valley to just invest more in UTA so that they can expand their routes in that part of the valley. Right. I mean, the front runner is the most expensive thing to operate. So if you get one front runner stop then in your city, like that's going to tie up a lot of your budget. That means there's going to be limited bus service to that front runner stop. Like you're going to end up having a last mile problem, which means like, yeah, you get the front runner stop. But then how do you get people there? Right. So. Right. And also urban sprawl. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing because like good public transit and like well-designed public transit can alleviate some of the headaches of urban sprawl traffic jams and commutes and, you know, parents feeling yeah. like Uber drivers. But also, like, it's going to be easier to provide a handful of bus stops in a dense community than to be getting people in these really, really sprawling communities like what Harriman looks like now. I mean, the the thing, the, like, key takeaway here with this bill is that it relies on a false premise. And the false premise is that the suburbs are subsidizing Salt Lake City's public transit options. And the truth is, when you look at the numbers, 
that the reverse is actually true. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's the case with many, many regional services yeah. as well. But this bill made it out of committee. So, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. It got a little bit of buzz like last week. It could pick up steam or it could fall to the wayside. That's the beauty of the legislative session. <laughs> Right. Well, and one more thing I'll say about this is this is actually probably a really good time to be having this conversation Mm -hmm. because the Olympics, we're planning for the Olympics in 2034. And a big part of that will be transit and transportation planning. So, you know, maybe this conversation shifts over the the next couple of years even. Yeah. I mean, it's also going to be, I imagine, a big piece of some of these development proposals that we're getting in the south part of the county, like Utah City, which has promised to be a walkable city, Um, potentially an NHL stadium in the south part of the county. Like there's a lot of reasons to want to increase. I you will not catch me saying a a north south divide, (laughs) but like getting people into the south part of the county from the city, you know, if they take the jazz, I don't know. The the city to burbs divide. city to burbs (laughs) divide. Exactly. As it happens, I just finished watering my Peperomia from Lux Floral and Design, and I am excited to tell you that they are hosting an upcoming terrarium and planter class with four dates to choose from, March 1st, 2nd, 8th, and 9th. Admission is $35 and includes pea gravel, dirt, the education, and award-winning food and beverages. Plants, terrarium, and other elements are not pre-selected, so there'll be an additional cost during the class. This class and your resulting greenery are a fun way to brighten your spring and create a lasting arrangement for your home. Plus, it's a family-friendly time, so bring your garden-curious kid. Go to luxfloral.com and click on the classes tab to see this and other hands-on classes. And if you're planning a wedding or an event and want to look through Lux Floral's gorgeous design work, stock them on Instagram at Lux Floral and Design. Hey, it's Ivana Martinez, producer of CityCast Salt Lake. I love my job. But making this podcast a newsletter every day isn't always easy. With daily production, when one thing goes wrong, suddenly a lot can fall apart. Like the time a fire alarm went off during a recording and then our guests got trapped inside a parking garage and I suddenly had to jump on as the guest while half of our four-person team was out. Those are the days I wish we could just not make a newsletter or a podcast for tomorrow. But we know how important it is for you to have this reliable daily way of making sense of what's happening in our city. And so we always find a way to show up for you. The CityCast Salt Lake membership program is asking you to show up for us. Members can help make sure that we can keep doing this work that matters to you and your neighbors. Let's keep making this city more fun and livable. Members get special perks like ad-free listening and exclusive updates. You can become a member at membership.citycast.fm. Thank you. All right, Emily. We talked about it earlier this week. We're going to talk about it again. It is the talk of the town. This proposed Major League Baseball stadium on the west side of Salt Lake City in Fair Park because we got a new bill. Mm-hmm. And it mm-hmm. is pretty ugly. It's a huge bill. It's 116 pages, more than 3,500 lines, Allie, and it's coming right near the end of the session. So let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, This bill creates the Utah Fair Park Area Investment and Restoration District. Mm. It is sponsored by Representative Ryan Wilcox, who is actually from Ogden, a Republican from Ogden. And I want to give a really quick disclaimer because, as we've said, things can move quickly and change quickly in the legislature. This is what this bill does as of Thursday morning when we're recording this show. So 
This bill appears to have huge impacts for Salt Lake City. Um, it creates this project area for the de development of this sports and entertainment district, which will kind of be centered around this Major League Baseball stadium in the Fair Park neighborhood. And Ali, this bill has a map that carves out the specific area. And the general boundaries are the area north of I-80 and between 1000 West and Redwood Road. So really like along North Temple, across from the Fair Park and the surrounding neighborhoods there. And the reason why this bill is setting off some alarm bells for city leaders is because it creates a board to oversee this district, which is within Salt Lake City's boundaries. Yeah. And that board has five members, Two appointed by the governor, one appointed by the House Speaker, one ap appointed by the Senate President, and one from Salt Lake City. So if you're doing the math there, Salt Lake City is certainly in the minority of this voting board compared to all of the state appointed members. So the board governing a rapidly gentrifying, predominantly people of color neighborhood in Salt Lake City will be appointed by a governor who one time was quoted saying he believes the heart and soul of our city, of our state, is not Salt Lake City, but rather rural Utah. The Senate president who doesn't live in Salt Lake City. And then who decides who gets the, the one seat, the one Salt Lake City representative seat? That will be the council member whose district encompasses most of the project area. So that's one seat for Salt Lake City on this voting board. And this board can make decisions about levying taxes in this area. It can use property tax revenue to pay for infrastructure and other amenities. Um, it also appears to be able to make land use decisions for this area. And that to me is huge because one of a city's key functions is to make land use decisions for the land within its boundaries. Yeah. So this is a land. Grab. Allie, this has really given me like inland port vibes. Uh -huh. Honestly, the inland port is basically where I-15 and I-80 meet each other. Legislators said this is one of the greatest cross. This is the crossroads of two of the biggest interstate systems in the West, which means this is where a lot of cargo is traveling. It's also near our airport where a lot of cargo is traveling in the same way that ocean ports have port authorities that manage them as economic entities. We should have a port authority that manages this area as an economic entity. And the port authority is an unelected board that, at least when it was created, could decide what to do with the land and the tax revenue in that project area. Mm -hmm. And Salt Lake City went to court over it and we lost in court over it. And... Yeah, to me, it very much so mirrors what we saw back then. What's so interesting to me about this MLB proposal and like, of course, the crossfire of conversation about it is very much like, well, this isn't exactly, you know, going to be funded with public tax dollars because it's a bond that will be paid back by increasing hotel taxes and all these things. And like, you know, we've got this We've got this mechanism laid out in this bill that says we're going to raise basically taxes on tourists to pay for the stadium. And then that money will pay back the bonds that our state is writing to build mm -hmm. the stadium up front. And so, like, that's not really taxpayer dollars, whatever. All this crossfire about, like, the who, what, when, where, why. But the thing about it that's so frustrating to me is more of a zooming out is that this is a – an intrusive form of urban planning to waltz into a neighborhood, to exercise a land grab, to buy it up and to say, you're getting this. And by the way, you should thank us for it. Like the very fact that Representative Wilcox, who sponsored this bill, creating this authority board to govern the stadium, doesn't live in Salt Lake. He's from Ogden. Like, we can't even get a Salt Lake County legislator to run this. It's so indicative of what it's like to be decision making for a community you're not a part of when you are not even a little bit afraid of the consequences. And, you know, what this shows to me, Allie, I think those are really astute points. Basically, when the legislature sees an economic opportunity, they're going to jump on it and they're going to insert themselves 
into the community and, you know, like no matter the cost, because there's money to be made here. There's money to be made for a certain amount of people. There's money to be made for people who can afford to be investing up front in this. There's money to be made for people who have an economic stake. There isn't necessarily money to be made for the everyman. Like, I think we should be constantly questioning whether or not the stadium is a solid economic investment. Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. if you do any amount of research on stadium building, there is decades indicating that, like, it's not there, that the output isn't necessarily there. And, like, economists are literally trying to wrap their heads around why state leaders, why legislators in cities across the nation continue to dump money into these sports franchises that continue to not show economic development in return. Like these economists are doing backflips trying to figure out why we're so gaga for these sports teams and they can't figure it out. Right, right. Well, let me tell you some of the response to this bill, Ali. Uh, First of all, we mentioned it's really huge, um, 116 pages released in the last 10 days of the session. It's a lot to take in. And so much so that I tried to get a quote from Salt Lake City about this. And they said, you know, we're excited about the possibility of Major League Baseball, but um, we're still trying to figure out all of the impacts this has to us and to our authority. They said it creates immediate concerns about the apparent diversion of tax revenue and land use away from city city services. Um, So they're still reviewing the legislation and its impacts. And an important caveat there is also, regardless of whether or not we get this MLB team, does this bill still exercise this kind of authority over the Fair Park neighborhood? Regardless. Yeah. And you know what? We still have a week left in the session. Um, I imagine there will be some tweaks to this legislation before the end. But a lot of people are feeling like this is really rushed. And Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they're right to feel that way. And in that way, it is, again, similar to the creation of the Inland Port Authority. That that bill came out in the final weeks of the session as well. And Salt Lake City was like, whoa, can we pump the brakes? We did not expect this to happen in this way. And I feel like we're seeing the exact same thing. Um, one member of the council did speak out on this, and that is council member Ale Pui. Like we said, the stadium will likely be in his district boundaries. And he said, it feels like a slap in the face to so many interactions, so many promises from the Miller group that this bill was going to be done right. I mean, okay, a billionaire made you a promise and you believed them. I'm I'm so sorry. You feel wronged. <laughs> It makes me wonder how much control Salt Lake City actually has of this situation. You know, how much they're really at the table with this particular project and with the future of this neighborhood, of this community, Allie. I feel like we are watching a lot of these legislators who represent Salt Lake City fall into the trap of being sweet talked by the Millers, by Big League Utah, by Ryan Smith, because now what we know is that there's basically going to be a copycat piece of legislation for an NHL team that mimics in many ways this investment for, you know, version 2.0 to get a hockey team. And now, like, Representative Sandra Hollins co-sponsored the the bill in support of bringing MLB here. And now her district might undergo this land grab, like, two days later. Right. One of the things that David Figler, the host of CityCast Las Vegas, told us when we asked him about how Vegas is dealing with becoming a sports enterprise and seeing public funding drained towards stadiums was like, be very prepared to be sweet talked and told that your state's different. Your city's different. It will work here because like prepare to be culture campaigned heavily and be incredibly skeptical of it. And I continue to be. Well, Allie, hate to burst your bubble again, but, uh, you know, we mentioned the possibility of an NHL arena in the south part of the valley. We've actually got a bill this week sponsored by Senator Dan McKay, who lives in Riverton, uh, and this bill would create, uh, would allow Salt Lake City to create an NHL sports and entertainment district in downtown Salt Lake City. So this bill is actually very different um, because it puts the decision-making power in Salt Lake City's hands rather than an unelected 
board's hands for the MLB district. So for now. we don't have time to get into the, the nuances of the NHL bill, but these two are uh, happening in tandem and, um, you know, they could dramatically change our city forever. We definitely don't have time to get into that. And as we always say, with the Utah legislature, anything could change. So if it does, we will let you know about it the next time we convene to make this show. Let's do pick of the week and get out of here. Let's end on a high note. We've been ranting. I'll start, if I may. Mm -hmm. Allie, much to your surprise, I'm actually not a theater kid. Oh, come on. I'm a band geek. (laughs) You're not a theater. Oh, you are a band geek. Okay, yeah, I can see it. I'm a band geek. Uh But, you know, I always wanted to be a theater kid. And uh, this past weekend, I went to see a play. I saw a play at Salt Lake Acting Company. I have never been. I've lived in Salt Lake for, you know, more than a decade now and never been to Salt Lake Acting Company. It is a small professional theater company in the Capitol Hill neighborhood. And they very generously comped us tickets to uh, their new play called You Will Get Sick. And uh, it completely wrecked me. (laughs) And I I was so moved. It was funny and sad and clever and tears streaming down my face. Wow, you cried? I think everyone should go see this play. I cried so hard, Allie, and so did producer Ivana Martinez, who saw it with me. And we were just bawling our faces off. So I highly recommend uh, seeing this play. You Will Get Sick is what it's called, and it runs through March 3rd support local theater, I guess. Okay. My pick of the week is my absolute favorite building in Salt Lake City. I love it so much that I have a um, print of it on the wall in my house. And that is the Walker Center. It is 16 stories of pure joy and history for me. And um I thought it was really funny. If you open the, up the Wikipedia article for the Walker Center, it's described as a skyscraper, which I'm like, we're calling 16 stories a skyscraper. <laughs> like, it's like, we're just Not calling quite. everything a skyscraper. <laughs> like, it's all relative. Um, but the coolest thing about the Walker Center to me that I think all Salt Lakers are familiar with is the weather tower on the top, which is a 46-foot color-changing pyramid-like weather tower where the words read Walker Center. And I learned something really interesting about it because we've been having a lot of rain recently and like snow and it's been kind of coming and going. And I feel like I'm constantly staring at the Walker Center and being like, what does the flashing red mean again? Or like, wait, it's blue. Mm-hmm. Is that good? Is it's Now it's solid red. Like it's giving mean girls there's a 30% chance it's already raining, you know? <laughs> So I looked it up and discovered this little moniker that I think we as Salt Lakers have gotten away from using. And it goes, solid blue, skies are too. Flashing blue, clouds are due. Solid red, rain ahead. Flashing red, snow instead. Okay. I'm never going to remember Really? That. <laughs> solid yeah. blue, skies are too. Flashing blue, clouds are due. Okay. Due. Solid due. red, rain ahead. Flashing red, snow instead. Okay. You'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Or I'll just lick my finger and put it to the wind to determine what the... Exactly. <laughs> or you can do is. what I've been doing for years, which is when I'm walking or driving past the Walker Center and it is any color, whether solid or blinking, turning to the person <laughs> next to me and saying, some weather's about to happen. <laughs> yep. <yeah. laughs> weather is coming. You're always right that way. Weather is coming. I also learned this interesting thing, which is that for 26 years, the Walker Center did not light up because there was a Salt Lake City ordinance that about the height limit for signage. And it was determined Mm -hmm. that the Walker Tower was Walker Tower was too tall to like be allowed to have a sign on it, basically, and that the blinking lights were kind of a sign. And then in 2008, it joined the National Registry of Historic Places and the city council and Mayor Ralph Becker were like, all right, let's light it up again. Yeah. So there you go. The 
the what it oh, you're not a lord of the rings person but it's like, i like lord the, of rings. the beacon of gondor is lit the, be- the beacon is lit the beacon is lit okay <laughs> funny you should say that because a salt lake city council member in 2008 when they relit the walker center no. was quoted saying this i kind of see this as our own little piece of Times square Hopefully, it's just the beginning of a trend to come to bring bright light and vitality and vibrancy to the downtown area. Wow. (laughs) Which is like, they could have said that today. Wait till he finds out we're getting the NHL and the MLB. Oh, my God. Thanks for the fun facts, (laughs) Ali. You bet. He's having his Roxy Hart moment. Okay, let's get out of here. Uh, Executive producer Emily Means, have a fantastic weekend. I will see you on Monday. See you Monday, Ali. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Our executive producer is Emily Means. Our producer is Ivana Martinez. Our newsletter editor is Terina Ria. And our host is me, Ali Bayarta. Music is by the local band Mitochondria with additional music from All the Kimonos. Our Great Salt Lake theme song is by Daniel Foster Smith. We will be back Monday morning with more from around this city. Have a great weekend. 